Hey everybody, Justin here. Thank you for checking out this video. I wanted to use this video to, to talk about a quote by James that is a very well-known quote. And James was a physicist. He's also very influential in Bayesian statistics, probability in general. And this, this quote is often used to argue against randomness or randomness is bad or, or something like that. And I don't know if James himself thought that, but that's what the quote is used for often online. So the quote is this, it appears to be a quite general principle that whenever there is a randomized way of doing something, then there's a non-randomized way that delivers better performance but requires more thought. So I wanted to kind of deconstruct this quote and give my opinion on it because I don't find it uh, super convincing, the argument that using this quote is, well, first of all, I don't believe it to be a general principle uh, at all more of Jane's opinion, but I definitely don't think it's good support for saying that randomization is, you know, somehow bad or um, inefficient or something like that. So let me um, go through my argument here. So just some background for me, I've been a mathematical statistician professionally since 2005 and went to grad school um, for that. And um, anyways, so that's my background. From this, um, from this quote, first of all, I can see it's kind of presented as a false dichotomy. In real life, you know, we don't need to choose between only non-random or only random methods. I mean, that's kind of ridiculous. In fact, if I'm doing some type of sampling, there'll be parts of it that are fixed and parts of it that are random. You know, there'll be parts of it like the sampling parameters, like how the sample size, or there could be a fixed sample size, you know, different parameters, different strata. Um, those things could be fixed, and then obviously the specific units that get selected could be random. So we don't need to ever choose between only non-random or only random, but I feel that this quote is often used to argue that. So right off the bat, I can see a problem with that type of arguing. The second, if we look at the quote, more thought and better performance are not well defined really so you know there is a you know other way that delivers better things if there's more thought put into it well that's a tautology and that goes for if the method is random or non-random you put more thought into a method it most likely will give better performance so i don't find the more thought um very um uh, very um, convincing. I mean, yes, it's true regardless of any method in any field that you do. But the better performance, I think, is maybe more problematic because it's undefined here. What are we talking about better performance? So, for example, if I'm doing, again, my experience is in surveys and experimental design, you know, better performance. So, are we talking, you know, the estimates are better? The algorithm runs faster, we get done with the project earlier, it's less costly, it's easier to explain, it has better, you know, lower bias. What are we talking about when we say better performance? It's very vague here. And just to say, like, um, you know, all the time, the non-randomized way is better performance in every way? No. No, that's not, that's not accurate. Now, what I do know is from at least the 1920s, could have been slightly before, it actually could have been slightly after too, I'm not entirely sure, but that's about when sampling theory really took off. Um, and, you know, from then it's been used in just about every, every field as um, kind of like a gold standard for learning about a subject. Um, and then, of course, experimental design you know, formal experimental design shortly after that. And so what we know is that sampling is less costly, more timely, you get the results faster. But the main thing I feel is that there's less non-sampling error. And often the sampling error is much smaller than the non-sampling errors. So we have to take what's called like a total, you know, survey error approach and look at all the different types of error. You know, for example, if we're taking like a census, like a literal census of, 
whatever, everybody in the United States. That's going to be extremely costly. It's going to take a very long time. And there's going to be, there, there won't be any sampling error in theory, although there'll be units, there'll be people that we just cannot sample. We can't find them or they die or they move or something like that, right? So there'll still be some type of um, error, right? Sampling error in some way. Um, but also there'll be lots of non-sampling error. Say there's some interviewer bias. Say there's some errors with data entry. Um, different types of measurement error and so forth. So there's lots of non-sampling errors that often are much larger than the sampling error. So in terms of better performance, I think from sampling theory being so successful, we know that the randomization type methods are extremely useful. And I, I can define that better performance. I can define exactly what that means. Um, and again, I mentioned experimental design. Same idea. Uh, designing surveys and designing experiments is very similar and um, very related. So same thing with experimental design. Um, and having the randomized controlled trials being like a gold standard or meta-analysis of those randomized controlled trials. There are other methods that are decent, but, you know, randomization can help prevent bias and, so, and, and many other things. Um, that has kind of been used in science and other areas across, you know, across the whole world. So I feel that, you know, we know that from sampling and experimental design that they're useful and they involve randomness. Now, if you just say random, that typically implies like a uniform distribution. But random itself, random, um, you know, a distribution uh, excuse me, random can mean more than just a uniform distribution. You know, it can mean more than just rolling dice or flipping coins or something. So, you know, stratified sampling is just one of those, cluster sampling, and there's many, many, many other different types of ways to incorporate randomness. So, you know, if I was going to take a sample, again, of people in the United States and look at um, whatever, how much money they make per year or something like that, if I do a uniform sample, yeah, it's not that efficient. I might not even be guaranteed to get a person in each state or of each age or at each job or something like that. But if I define groups, say states, and then maybe within a state, I split it up into different, you know, incomes in a certain range or ages in a certain range or, you know, genders or whatever, right? I define these strata. And then within the strata, I do a random selection. You know, I'm more kind of controlling the sample, but it's still randomness is involved. So if you're saying by random, you only mean uniform, then yeah, that's kind of like the, in a sense, the worst case scenario for using randomization type methods. But that, that selection is itself is very rarely used in experimental design or survey design. For, for reasons just stated, you know, you want to make sure you, you control it as much as you can. I, I disagree with the idea of, you know, say non-randomized requires more thought, implying that ran methods that use randomness don't require thought, because often, as I mentioned, the, the, the thought is up front. You know, you have some sampling <clears throat> excuse me, or design of experiments that, you know, you could spend a couple years um, thinking everything through from, you know, what's your target population to the testing the questionnaires to doing a pilot to, you know, how am I going to yeah take the sample? How am I going to do estimation, variance estimation, imputation? How am I going to do any editing? you know, and, and so forth. There are lots of thought that's up front. And yeah, at some point, you're just going to press a button and take the sample. But the thought is put in all throughout the process. You might even do adjustments after the fact and so forth. So I, I, I disagree with kind of the, um, the tone in saying that with randomness, there's not much thought put in, because I find it to be really uh, almost the opposite in my, in my experience. Something else that we know is randomness, you know, well, let me put it this way. Humans, when they do something, you know, 
um, add bias to a process. You know, if I'm doing an experiment on, I don't know, some type of drug treatment, and it's just me giving people that I choose a treatment and stuff, first of all, that's hard to replicate. Second, I could be either consciously or subconsciously introducing bias in a process. So randomness, one of the main things that helps minimize that bias in assigning treatments and taking samples. Um, it, of course, can add variety. I already mentioned lower cost. Uh, one of the main things is, in general, it reduces the influence of gradients that this kind of vague, more thought uh, either did not or cannot think of. I'll give you just a just kind of a silly example. You know, if I look out here to my right, I have a fence. And this fence is about, I would say, about seven feet tall. So if I was going to measure the fence, of course, I just go out there and measure it. But say we're doing some sampling process, and that fence represents a, a survey variable we're interested in. Or we're doing an experimental design, and that represents a variable we're interested in measuring. Every, so it's about, you know, again, a little over seven feet. But every 10 feet, there's a post, and the height jumps up to about maybe eight, a little less than eight and a half feet. Then it goes back down, and it's that low height, then there's the post again, and then there's the regular height again, and then there's the post, and so forth. So you say, well, I can just measure that, you know, say randomly I choose lengths along the fence and measure it. On average, I'm going to be just fine with that estimate of the height of the fence. If I take a grid approach and my grid happens to coincide with that gradient, instead of getting that roughly seven foot, I could be getting that eight and a half or whatever I said um, if my grid coincides with that, right? So sometimes in your more thought, you can figure that stuff out, but sometimes there's gradients that you just cannot figure out, you don't know about. So the, the reducing of gradients, and in experimental design, this happens a lot. You might have some gradient in the soil, in the air, whatever, that you just cannot um, know about. Okay, so randomness helps minimize the effect of that. One thing for sure with optimization is, say in optimization you have a function, and say you find a minimum of that function. Okay, so imagine your functions like this and you're trapped right here in this and you say hey I found the minimum but really that's a local minimum and your actual minimum is over here right here well what randomness can do is you can add these kind of little random bumps to explore that function and randomness can move you out of this local minimum and move you into the global minimum and non-random methods really cannot do that as well I find so just right there, that would be, um, you know, better performance if you're finding the actual minimum. Now you might say, well, that's just like, you know, experimental design, and that's just surveys. It's that's just social sciences. That's not a real science. You know, real science, we don't need that. We just take measurements, and then we're done. Well, even even like physics, you know, one can take multiple measurements, and we know that. Um, averages are usually better than a single measurement. And there's also, again, because there's measurement error. There's also kind of quantum stuff, which I'm not an expert on, but the kind of jury is still out if the universe is actually random at its core or not, you know. But all these things speak to randomness and a dist having a distribution of results, right? So you're not, again, you don't know with certainty which result is true but you have a distribution, you have an average, you have a variance in those uh, spread of those results. And all those things to me speak of uh, randomness. You have a structure, you can't predict with certainty which it is. Now, I'm not exactly sure what James meant, but if he just meant less random is better, to me that's like saying less pregnant. You can't really have that, you know. You're either kind of random or not. So there's a fun there's a um a theorem from mathematical statistics, very basic, that says if you have a function, it's random if the input is random. So if I have a uniform distribution, a uniform, say, sampling process, and now I'm doing a stratified 
process. Yeah, I've defined strata and I'm sampling within it, but they're both still random. It's not like I can predict um, one entirely with certainty. So I think it still shows randomness is kind of fundamental. So I, I personally would turn this quote around and have it be more accurate. Still not 100% accurate, but more accurate. So I would say it appears to be a quite general principle that Whenever there's a non-randomized way of doing something, there's a randomized way that delivers better performance but requires more thought. And I, I can define the better performance. I can measure that in terms of sampling error, non-sampling error, cost, timeliness, and those things. I can actually you know, measure all that stuff, estimates being close and so forth. Um, what I would say is kind of outside of the sciences, and outside of those type of academic fields and stuff, randomness is quite useful. Just for example, think about listening to music and you can listen to a variety of music with like a shuffle feature. You can use it to, you know, change up the restaurant you're gonna go to for dinner or something. Um, it's used for, you know, encryption, for generating strong passwords. Used in video games to provide like a, Variety, you know, the, the, the bad guy, the sprites, the bad guys coming at you differently. It, it's used in so many fields, randomness, that it, it's hard to say that that could be better in a non randomized way. You know, like with a casino, would, if you're a casino, would you want your machines to be not random? I don't see how that would deliver better performance. So, anyways, I just wanted to talk about this quote. Because, yeah, I don't know Jane's actual intention of this quote, but in my experience, I feel it's almost the opposite, that the randomization methods tend to perform better than the non-randomized way. Again, because we're helping prevent bias, or possible bias, let's be fair, possible bias, okay? You know, we're not saying that everybody is... Uh, putting bias into a process on purpose. We just know that that happens with people and we're trying to prevent that. And we also know for a long time that there are non-sampling errors and that sampling error is often less than the non-sampling error. Uh, we know the success from experimental design, sample surveys, randomized controlled trials. So anyways, I just wanted to mention all those things because I find that that quote is often used to say random methods are bad somehow. So I just want to do a video to kind of explain why that's not the case. And I feel that the opposite is actually true. So, but thanks for checking out this video and I'll see you next one. Bye-bye.